Megan, is it recording on your end? Okay, weird, it's not showing up on mine. Oh, well. Well, it's 1032, so Amy, I think whenever you're ready, we're, we're good to go. Great. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Amy Neff, and I'm an adult services librarian at the Shoreline Library, which is part of the King County Library System. And thank you for joining us this morning for Cannabis 101, the Landscape Program. The King County Library System is pleased to partner with the Washington Poison Center to bring you this and other informative and educational online programs. And we do have our next one scheduled. It's called Adolescent Substance Abuse, a Poison Center Perspective. And it will take place on Saturday, January 23rd at 10 a.m. Registration is required and we'll share that link to the online registration form in the chat. And I also just wanted to mention that the King County Library System is offering a large variety of free online programs, aside from the one that you're attending right now. And these events range from story times to trivia nights to film screenings and lectures. So I encourage you to check out our website, kcls.org, to find a new program that's a great fit for you. And that's all I had to share with you this morning. So I'll turn it back over to Alex from the Washington Poison Center. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here, for being here virtually. Um, uh, like Amy said, my name is Alex Sorofsky, and I'm joined by uh, Megan King. We're both public health educators with the Washington Poison Center. So you're going to mainly see and hear from me today. Megan's um, going to be, uh, she's going to have the arguably more difficult task of being on the back end, prompting me to not forget things, reining me in, keeping me from rambling too much. So, um, here we go. So this is, uh, as Amy said, Cannabis 102. We really should have branded the thing 102 from the beginning. You are in the right spot. We called it, we had the idea to call it 102 um, uh, just the other day. So um, this is the second part in a two-part series. So the first one, I believe Megan will post the uh, uh, link to that recording in the chat box for any who's interested, who are interested in catching it, um, who weren't able to see it. And we'll give a bit of a summary of that. Um, now, halfway through, we'll, we'll, we'll address some of what came up in that first one. All right, so let's get going. So a bit of housekeeping. Um, if, you, if you don't mind, please introduce yourself. Uh, let us know if, if you'd like, um, kind of where you're coming from, where you're tuning in from, um, what, what your uh, affiliation is, what your uh, profession is. We just, it just helps us get a sense of our reach and who's interested in, in taking uh, this kind of training. Now, you are all uh, muted by default. Uh, please remain muted if you don't mind, just to keep things flowing all right. That doesn't mean to not engage, though. Well, there will be a few points where we ask questions of you, where, um, and we want you to ask questions of us. Just do so in the chat box if you don't mind. Um, if you ask a question in the chat box and I don't answer right away, it doesn't mean I'm ignoring you. It just means I'm trying to get to a good point in order to address it. And if we run out of time and I can't, if we can't get to all the questions um, uh, answered before we log out for the day, Megan and I will do our best to um, include those answers in any follow-up we send out. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and we will share that recording out when all is done. So here's our agenda for the day. So we're gonna talk about the Poison Center, who we are, what we do, um, and we're gonna, you're gonna get, uh, see this a lot today but you'll notice in the bottom right corner that is our phone number that is the the number the, to the telephone helpline so please add that to your phone if you haven't already um and there will be numerous opportunities to do so throughout so we're going to talk about legality so today is the cannabis landscape so it's a lot less about the health effects or health considerations um that was a lot of last time this time we're kind of trying to build context around cannabis we're then gonna spend some time talking about older adult cannabis use. Um, and then we'll switch gears and talk about youth cannabis use. And then we'll kind of wrap things up with just, just a little bit on communication and we'll have some resources at the, at the very end. All right, so I gotta give this a uh, qualifier here. You're hearing me use this term cannabis. It's called Cannabis 102. You've probably also heard a lot of these other terms, marijuana, pot, weed. There are so many different terms for this substance, for this plant, for this drug. We're going to actually dive into some of the nuance in, in, in this a little bit. Um, one of the takeaways, though, right now I want you to hold on to is that all of these refer to the same thing. Again, the same plant, the same substance. Um, and we'll talk a bit about some of the difference in history um, and a bit of stigma with, uh, um, with some of these terms. 
So starting with the poison center. So for us, we define poison very, very, very broadly. A poison for us is literally anything, any product or substance that's potentially harmful if it's used in any of these three wrongs. We've got the wrong way, uh, by the wrong person, or in the wrong amount. So that can be uh, household supplies, that can be plants, cleaners, bites or stings from, uh, from snakes, from other critters. It can also be medications, and yes, it can be substances. So here's our mission, just to kind of center ourselves in, in what we do and why we do it. So broadly, I'll just read this verbatim. Our mission is to prevent and reduce harm from poisoning through expertise, collaboration, and education. So right there, you see we are inherently prevention and harm reduction kind of wrapped up into one. We'd love, we'd love to prevent any sort of poisonings from ever happening to begin with. And if they do happen, that's why we're here. We want to reduce harm from those encounters, um, from those exposures. Now, the Washington Poison Center has been in existence for over 60 years in one form or another, which is pretty cool to me that, they, that this group has been doing this for, for this long. Now, I mentioned that number earlier. This number is super, super important, 800-222-1222. So this is the National Poison Center number, and it is always, always, always open. So you can call us at 2 p.m., 2 a.m., someone's going to answer. What will happen is it will route you to your local poison center, generally based on your area code. And if you happen to get transferred to a non-Washington Poison Center, that's okay. They're going to give you the exact same uh, uh, treatment advice. They're going to they're going to be there for you in the same way. Now, I want to emphasize this is a free number, so you're never going to be asked for insurance. You're never going to be asked billing questions. You're never going to get a bill from any poison center. Uh, we're also totally confidential, so the same laws that protect your information at a doctor's office, at a hospital, those apply to us as well. I think there there is sometimes concern from callers that. That, that we might uh, call the police on them, that we might report to Child Protective Services, and we absolutely won't. That is not our, that is not our thing. And finally, we offer interpretation services uh, in over 260 languages for anyone who prefers a language other than English. So a little bit on our data. This is actually super, super, super new data, um, and you can stay tuned on our website. Uh, we'll post kind of a, a publication on this, a little, little one-pager snapshot, we call them. Um, in the next week or so, hopefully next week or so. So this is looking at THC exposures by age group. For those who don't remember from last time or who weren't at last time, THC, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, this is the main cannabinoid or part of cannabis that, that leads to intoxication or contributes to intoxication. This is the thing that gets folks high, generally. Um, so this looks at 2019 and 2020 data. So this compares the first nine months of each year, and it looks at uh, the exposures by age group. So we see an increase in every single age group here. We see the biggest increases in little kids, zero to five, and in adults, ages 21 to 59. Now, this looks at uh, exposure reasons, THE exposure reasons. This is just looking at 2020, but it also breaks it down by age group. So you've got unintentional, um, which is just accidental. Uh, kid got into a thing because kids get into things. That's what they do. Um, intentional abuse, the way we define abuse here for poison center data means uh, desiring to get high, desiring uh, intoxication. And then misuse is a little odd. It, 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 we could spend a lot of time talking about misuse, but it's essentially uh, inappropriate use. It's used incorrectly. Um, and so you can see little kids generally almost that entire category is our, it's uh, unintentional exposure, the accidental exposure. Um, so a parent accident or guardian in the house accidentally left a, a, an edible out. kid got into it, something like that. And then generally for the adults, you see more of, of those intentional abuse cases. And that is when, again, someone is seeking uh, intoxication for whatever reason. Really. Um, and oh, I will say too, not every reason is included. So if you added up all these numbers, it's going to give you a different total than the previous slide. That's intentional. That's just because if we included all of them, that would be a gnarly looking graph. It'd be way too hard to follow. All right. So finally here, we're looking at THC exposures by formulation. So this is by the type. So we see by and large, most of our calls are on edibles. Um, almost half were on edibles. And then you've got a little over a quarter on plant material. So sometimes called dry flower, dry bud. Um, and then we have a smaller percentage, 15% here of our calls are on concentrates. These are products such as a 
CO2 oil, such as butane hash oil. Um, and then we have this elusive other category, which is always changing and growing because the, the products are always changing and growing. And so this can include uh, pills, capsules, topicals, and, and things along those, those lines. All right, please ask any questions you'd like about the Poison Center or our Poison Center data. Gonna move into a bit of legality, which requires some history for us to do properly. So starting with a bit of history, uh, why are we talking about history to begin with? Well, for one, cannabis legality is weird, to put it simply. It's this substance that is globally illicit generally, federally illicit generally, and still some states are legalizing anyway. So that leads to a whole bunch of state and federal tensions and a lot of confusion of to the, as to the legal status of this substance. Um, and this is changing super rapidly. And we'll go into some of this uh, change over the years in, in the next few slides. And I will just kind of leave this point here that the way in which anything, any substance is legalized can have some pretty powerful public health implications. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of uh, explore that a little bit as we go as well. So starting back in the early 1900s, yeah, we got to do some history. So from the early 1900s to present, hemp, which is a non-psychoactive form, uh, if you ever hear me say psychoactive, that means uh, intoxicating. Um, and it's a non-psychoactive form of the cannabis plant. It has, it is federally defined as the cannabis plant with less than 0.3% THC. So not supposed to bring about any, any, any uh, uh, intoxication effects. Now this product, it, it was a huge major, uh, huge major, huge agricultural product in the U.S. Um, and it has continued to be an agricultural product in the U.S. this whole time, but there was a shift. It used to be uh, uh, commercially available, and that ceased around the 1950s for a few reasons, and we'll talk about that um, throughout as well. And I do want to say, even though agriculture was the main thing, it was used in all these other products that, that weren't for um, uh, uh, intoxication, it doesn't mean psychoactive, uh, th that using it for its psychoactive effects did not occur. So it absolutely, did. it's just the nature of that has shifted a lot over the years. All right, so now we get to a trickier era. Um, we get to this fear and racism sector. And you'll notice this is, we, we draw this timeline out from the 30s to the present. And, and we'll, we'll explore this quite a bit. So this is an important name to remember, Harry Onslinger, Harry Anslinger. Um, he was the first commissioner of what was called the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Now, this entity, its whole thing was to, to enforce prohibition of alcohol. Now, once prohibition ended, it shifted its gear, it shifted its focus toward other substances as well. Um, and one of the main substances it targeted was cannabis. So, folks may have heard of this, this uh, of the 1936 propaganda film, Reefer Madness. Pretty easy to find. It's probably on YouTube. You can probably get it at the library. It's a little, it's a fascinating watch through, but this is a, a kind of an interesting representation of a lot of the rhetoric at the time. Part of what Onslinger was famous for, and we'll show some of his quotes in the next couple of slides, was taking racist and anti immigration rhetoric and kind of mashing it in with, uh, with cannabis, with rhetoric around cannabis. Generally, the, the most used term at the time was cannabis. And the um, marijuana, the term marijuana, is a Spanish term for this plant. Now, what he, a lot of what he did was intentionally use the term marijuana in order to try to merge those things together, to merge that anti-immigration rhetoric with anti-substance uh, uh, use, anti-cannabis use propaganda. So let's start with Reefer Madness a bit. Again, folks may have heard of this, but um, this is probably my favorite slide in all this. It's just, there's a lot here. So you see all these different uh, propaganda posters um, that came out at the time. So you see a lot of imagery here. You see women cry for it, men die for it, uh, drug crazed abandon. You see uh, marijuana, weed from the devil's garden. You see uh, uh, weed with roots in hell. And we get the devil's harvest. We get more devil's harvest. A good girl until she likes a reefer, and then again, reefer madness. So all of this um, uh, was circulating at the time, and this propaganda film, uh, I believe, was government-sponsored, so it says a lot about that time. So some of the quotes from Harry Onslinger, and I'm not going to read all of these, um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that they do exist. 
Um, marijuana, oh, and this is not a misspelling, it was just commonly spelled with an H at the time. Marijuana is the most violent drug in the history of mankind, says Onslinger. Um, no one knows when he places a marijuana cigarette to his lips whether he will become a joyous reveler in a musical heaven, a mad insensate, a calm philosopher, or a murderer. Uh, the primary reason to outlaw marijuana is its effects on the degenerate race is so uncomfortable to say. And this last one here, I'll let you read to yourself for just a moment. All right, but yes, I do think these do a, a good job of sort of painting the picture of a lot of uh, uh, the propaganda he was push pushing forward. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to this in a, in a few slides to address why we have this bar continuing to the present. So we're jumping back to 1937. This is kind of a shift. Um, taxation started happening uh, with the Marijuana Tax Act of that year, and that started taxing all cannabis sales. Now, there really a better version of this timeline would show a bit of a gradient from taxation to criminalization because it wasn't just a hard line it was a very gradual process um and a lot of local jurisdictions were, were uh criminalizing cannabis on their own and then um uh, federally this started to happen more and more and more and by 1970 we see the controlled substances act come into place then president nixon uh, signed this in 1970, and in 1971 declared the war on drugs officially. Now, for those who don't know of the Controlled Substances Act, it placed a bunch of different substances on what we call a schedule system. Um, and so Schedule 1, I'll just read this verbatim, Schedule 1 drugs, substances, or chemicals are defined as drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high high potential for abuse. So basically what this means is that this portion of the federal government views cannabis as having no medicinal value, no therapeutic value, as well as a high potential for dependence and for addiction. And we get this tiny little sliver at the end of legalization. And, and again, taxation kind of comes back. Um, now, this is weird because this whole time, even today, cannabis is still a Schedule One substance and states are legalizing anyway. So this started with California in 1996. They were the first state that brought on, uh, that created uh, what we call a medical marijuana market. Um, and we'll define a bit more about, uh, about medical versus retail throughout. And then 2012, the very first states who brought on uh, a retail cannabis market for Washington and Colorado. All right, so uh, inequities of enforcement. Again, we can't talk about history um, and legality of cannabis without acknowledging this portion here, the inequities around it. So a lot of the advocacy, at least in Washington, that, that, was, that was pushing for cannabis to be legalized through Initiative 502, a lot of that, the, the, the intention behind it was to reduce arrest rates. Um, and historically, people of color have been arrested for cannabis, uh, whether it's possession, consumption, uh, DUIs, whatever it is, significantly more than white folks. And it does not mean that there's a, a, a massive disparity in use between, but it does mean there has been more targeting of enforcement. Now, in some ways, this worked in that total Washington cannabis arrests dropped really significantly uh, in 2012 following I-502. However, the disparity of arrests specifically between African Americans and whites is a lot more complicated. It, in some ways, the disparity shrunk. In some ways, the disparity got worse. And it depends on if we're talking about possession or sale. So if we're looking at arrest rates for marijuana or cannabis possession, that disparity shrunk slightly. Before legalization, African Americans were arrested 2.6 times more than white folks. Post that changed to 2.3 times, so a 14% decrease, which is which is good. We said that we see a slight decrease, but it's there's still a lot of work to do there. Now, when we're looking at sales, this skyrocketed, the, the, the disparity skyrocketed. So pre-legalization, African Americans were arrested <clears throat> a little over three times more than white folks. This um, uh, changed to seven times more. That's a 127% increase um, in the enforcement of cannabis sales. So we bring that up 
specifically to show that there's a lot more work to do from the, the, the social justice perspective, that simply legalizing does not solve the issue of inequity of enforcement. All right, so bringing it back to um, um, some definitions. I mentioned earlier medical versus retail. Medical, very broadly, refers to a marketplace or an infrastructure that requires some form of medical authorization um, uh, to, for, for someone to access cannabis um, in this particular realm. Um, and so typically, and this range is hugely depending on what the state is and what, what their system is, but basically it's saying this person has this kind of condition which, which qualifies them to access cannabis. So retail, on the other hand, sometimes it's called non-medical, recreational, regular, adult, all these different terms. Um, it doesn't require medical authorization. Uh, every system that, that, that has come into place so far has required an age restriction. Um, and all, all states, um, to my knowledge, have used ages 21 and up for, to allow folks to legally purchase uh, cannabis. Now, um, this is a map of, of the U.S. Starting in 1996, all the gray states in, indicates no legal market. The blue here will indicate medical, um, medical marijuana, and the green will indicate uh, a retail marketplace or infrastructure. Uh, so this is a bit of a time lapse, and the whole point is just to show the momentum that's built over time. So we're going through in the early or late 90s, early 2000s, and we start to see more blue pop up. That's the medical. And then watch what happens in 2012. So more blue is happening, and then boom, you start to get green. And once green shows up, we start to see not only more green, but a whole lot more blue. So all the way to this year, and there were quite a few more states who have hopped on board since. Um, just just in these past couple months. <clears throat> so to date, we have 34 states with at least some form of medical and 15 states with some form of retail allowance. Now, very quickly, um, uh, I'll just speak a little bit to CBD. Some folks may have heard of CBD. Uh, it's can uh, oh my goodness, I can't speak this morning. It's another cannabinoid, another uh, component of the cannabis plant, uh, cannabidiol, cannabidiol. Um, we don't believe that it's intoxicating on its own, but we need to learn a whole lot more about it. So in, uh, before 2018, hemp, this is the, the, the non-psychoactive form of the plant. Hemp you, was a part of the Controlled Substances Act. It was all, it was side by side with cannabis. 2018 removed it from that act, removed it from the schedule system. So hemp, which is again, cannabis with less than 0.3% THC, um, uh, is now commercially available. This means that folks can derive CBD from hemp products directly, or from hemp directly. Um, this is why there was almost this overnight explosion, a little over, oh, well, almost two years ago now, um, of CBD products. So just, just important to, to keep in mind. Little bit on Washington's legality. So um, these are the current uh, qualifying conditions that might allow someone to access the medical marijuana system. Um, this is from our the Washington Department of Health website. They've got a lot of interesting information there. Feel free to take a gander. Now, Washington originally legalized uh, medical marijuana in 1998. And then after passing I-502, uh, legalizing the retail market, in 2016, we actually merged the two. Now, what that means is prior to 2016, there used to be what was called a, a cannabis dispensaries that only folks with the medical authorization could access. Now, all folks, regardless of retail or medical, purchase from uh, uh, legalized um, uh, licensed retailers. Some of these licensed retailers will sell <clears throat> medical products in addition to the retail products, right? So. Uh, like I said earlier, access to this market, to the medical market requires authorization from a healthcare practitioner. And typically what happens is for folks who have one of these qualifying conditions, they have to um, uh, demonstrate that they've gone through the medical standard of care. What that means is that they have um, uh, gone through whatever treatment is, is deemed most medically appropriate for that condition and to demonstrate that it didn't work or it didn't work very well. Then sometimes um, a provider will, will um, uh, 
uh, provide this authorization to the medical marketplace. Now, I will note a lot of these conditions here are not necessarily backed by a bunch of robust evidence. And this speaks to, to cannabis being a Schedule One substance. It's because it is very difficult to research Schedule One substances for a whole lot of reasons. Um, but we're constantly wanting in, uh, more research on this to see what, um, what the research says. All right, just a little more on the medical system um, for those who are curious. So a lot of folks will have this little recognition card and it, and it provides them access to, uh, uh, they can purchase higher amounts legally, uh, folks who have this authorization. Um, they can avoid the sales tax around cannabis, but they may still have to pay the, the excise tax. Um, they're allowed to grow at home is actually kind of interesting. Washington's the state or one of the, the only state or one of the only states that does not allow folks to grow a cannabis plant at home without the, the medical card. <clears throat> and it also grants folks access to a, uh, what we call medical marijuana consultants. So um, for those who haven't heard this term, folks who are you know behind the counter at a, at a cannabis retailer are generally called bud tenders, uh, kind of like bartender, but bud. Um, some folks, uh, some bud tenders are able to go through additional training and certification and, uh, and can be called medical marijuana consultants. So what this means is they can give um, advice on what type of cannabis may be most appropriate for a given condition. There are limitations there. So if someone's approved, jump back to this slide, say someone is approved for cannabis to assist with their, uh, you know, to help treat pain uh, or symptoms around glaucoma then the medical consultant can only speak to glaucoma. They can't also talk about PTSD. They can't also talk about other ailments unless it is written on that card. All right, so <clears throat> what did I-502 do? So it allowed folks to be able to legally purchase cannabis, again, from licensed retailers. Folks have to be 21 years of age, not just to purchase, but also to possess or use. And even with this legalization, there are, um, uh, there are a lot of caveats. It is still illegal to use in public. It is still illegal to drive under the influence of cannabis. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, it's illegal to grow at home without that medical authorization. This one trips folks up a lot. It is still illegal to take across state and tribal lines. So take Oregon, for example. Oregon has very similar legality around cannabis as Washington. They have a retail system. It is illegal to take Washington cannabis into Oregon and vice versa. Um, same with, with tribal lines. Not all um, uh, federally recognized tribes have legalized cannabis. Now, um, this one is important as well. It's also illegal to use on federal lands, waters, or federally funded property within a state. So if someone wants to go to uh, Rainier National Park, they cannot legally take their cannabis with them. Um, and we, we find it important to include some of the current federal repercussions that still exist, not as a scare tactic. Scare tactics aren't very effective at, at deterring folks to, um, uh, against using anything, uh, but just to <clears throat> help keep folks informed about what the current legality is. So uh, cannabis use or possession charges can lead to job loss, depending on the type of job. Um, it can disqualify fo certain folks, or, or excuse me, it can disqualify folks from accessing federal student financial aid. Um, it can make folks ineligible to own firearms, which is kind of interesting. A lot of folks don't know that one. Um, that they're, In the background check, there is a question asking about uh, marijuana use. Um, and it can also disqualify folks from federally subsidized housing, uh, which also has an equity component to that as well. Okay, we've gone through the legality portion. We're going to shift gears a bit and start talking about uh, a couple different groups. Um, this is the point when I'll do a bit of a, a Cannabis 101 summary. So this is what we talked about last time. Again, I encourage you to check out the YouTube recording um, to get a lot more detail and nuance there. One of the big things is cannabis is really weird. It has this kind of combo of some of its effects or correlations seem to be therapeutic. Other effects and correlations seem to be pretty harmful, pretty risky. This research is growing all the time. Um, the legality around it is changing all the time. Um, a lot of local markets especially are coming out with new products all the time. And uh, this is an important point, doses are increasing. Average dose now versus where it was even 10 years ago is significantly higher. So it's a almost a different substance than it was um, a while back. Now, <clears throat> 
I, I do want to state, we talked a lot last time about acute concerns or acute risk. Acute means short-term in the moment intoxication. Those concerns are very different from chronic use concerns. So in, in this case, we're kind of talking about intoxication. And I, you, uh, we can't emphasize enough, don't drive while intoxicated with cannabis. It doesn't help. Um, you could still get a DUI. But we talk about intoxication versus dependence. And dependence is one of the big, big, big concerns with long-term use, with chronic use. So what do we mean when we say dependence? Uh, we love defining things at the poison center. So dependence, very generally, occurs when the body or the brain starts to rely on some external outside substance to maintain normal function. So my silly little example with this is coffee. You've noticed me taking a few sips of this this morning. Um, I have a physical dependence on coffee, or really caffeine. Uh, my normal function in this case is, is being alert, being awake, being able to, to talk to you all today about cannabis landscape. Um, now, tolerance. Tolerance occurs, or what tolerance is, is when you need more and more and more and more of that external substance to maintain that normal function. So depending on you know what's going on with work, what's going on with the world, I might find myself having more and more and more and more coffee all the time. And that is typically in response to a tolerance that I may have developed to caffeine. Now with dependence, reducing or quitting the, the intake of that substance can lead to withdrawal symptoms. So for me, if I just if I didn't drink any of this this morning, I might have a headache, might be a little more lethargic, I may be a little more well, hello everyone, how you doing today? A little less gestury and, and all that. So those could be minor examples of, of withdrawal symptoms. Now addiction occurs. This is a very broad definition, very broad term, but this occurs when dependence starts to disrupt other aspects of life. There are a bunch of different ways we can define this and, and um, that, that uh, professionals will diagnose this. Um, but one of the important points is that dependence itself, that physical dependence is a symptom of addiction. All right, so we bring this up to, to make this point here, <clears throat> that there is so much rhetoric, at least that we've heard, that, well, cannabis isn't addictive, or it's, eh, it does, it's not physically addictive, it doesn't, or it's not as addictive as a lot of other substances, like nicotine or heroin or whatever. Um, it's worth noting, nicotine and heroin are two of the most addictive substances, period, so that's not a great bar to compare a substance against. And two, we do have um, more and more research, more and more reports that, that folks who use daily or nearly daily, so pretty heavy users, who then quit will often report withdrawal symptoms. And withdrawal implies physical dependence. So we cannot say that cannabis does not bring on dependence. Now, some of the common withdrawal symptoms we, we've come across are uh, sleep disruption, anxiety, irritability, depression or depressed mood, and headaches. Now, one of the tricky things here is that withdrawal symptoms I actually overlap with some of the reasons why someone might use cannabis to begin with. So uh, we talked about this a little more last time uh, in, in our last presentation, but if someone is taking cannabis to help with sleep, it may work really, really well in the short term, but over time, if they use it again and again and again and again, they may develop that tolerance component. And if they stop for whatever reason, say they're, they're, they don't wanna deal with some of the more negative sides of THC, um, they may have even worse sleep disruption afterward as a withdrawal symptom. So it could create a bit of a, a use feedback loop there. Now, folks may have heard of, of this term here, the, the gateway hypothesis or gateway uh, uh, phenomenon. Now, essentially, this is the idea that using one substance will open a gateway and lead to, to the use of other substances. Um, and so there's a lot of research on this. Um, and the, these two statements here, these actually come from uh, a, a fantastically done review by the state of Colorado that basically looked at as much evidence as they could find, all the publications they could access, um, and they put together these, these evidence statements, these conclusion statements, um, depending on, on the quality of evidence behind it. So this first one here, and these are paraphrased, by the way, for adults, this is just adults, we probably know the cannabis use is correlated with substance use disorder for these other substances, alcohol, tobacco, and others. Now, I wanna highlight this term correlated. This does not mean that cannabis use causes substance use disorder with these other substances. It simply means that there's, there may be a link there. Um, so it could very well be that 
a common set of factors that lead to cannabis use may also contribute to substance use disorder with these other substances. Now for adults, again, we may know, this is slightly, slightly less evidence here, we may know that cannabis use is correlated with later initiating tobacco use. What's interesting is it's actually a stronger uh, pathway the other direction that that um, uh, tobacco use leads to cannabis use more so than the other way. Now, um, a little bit on uh, cannabis use disorder. Cannabis use disorder is the the newest way of diagnosing cannabis addiction. This is what's used in the most current version of the DSM. Um, and there are a whole bunch of different criteria and components that go into that. Uh, but we do like to to put this slide in to show that there is treatment available for cannabis use disorder. Um, and there, oh, these treatments, see, these are just a few of the ones they listed, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, multidimensional family therapy. These can be very, very, very effective for folks who are struggling with cannabis use disorder. And again, that is a, a kind of a, an intense way of defining that basic definition we gave of disruptive to other aspects of life. All right, I'm going to zip through so we don't run too far behind here. We're going to now talk about older adult cannabis use. Now, part of it, this is a little difficult to explore because a lot of the data um, isn't all that great. Uh, it's self-reported and there can be some issues with, with reliability of self-reported data. A lot of it's dated, so a lot of it comes from um, uh, before legalization occurred in 2012. And a lot of it is national data, so it doesn't give us a great sense of local trends. What we do see from these publications from 2014 um, nationally is that 50 to 64 year olds, um, uh, 5.6 to 9.1 percent, there's a big range there depending on the study, um, report uh, of this population, I should say, report that they used cannabis recently. That just means at least once within the last 30 days. Um, now, these same publications show that for folks 65 and older, uh, 1.3 to 2 percent of this population reported recent cannabis use. Now, these trends, even though we don't always have the exact numbers, we do see some general trends forming and that there is an increase over time of, uh, of the percentage, percentage of older adults who are using cannabis. There's also a decrease in the percent of older adults who are um, who perceive risk or harm from cannabis use. And those two tend to correlate. Increase in use often goes hand in hand with a decrease in concern about use. Now we were able a while back to come across some more recent local data, which was really exciting. We love recent local data. Um, now there was a, <clears throat> an interesting survey done of 900 residents um, between Washington, Colorado, and Oregon. All three of these states have retail cannabis legalized. Um, and, uh, and all 900 of these residents reported use of cannabis. Now, of this group, a little over a third, actually, 35% of this group were over age 55. Um, and that's a significantly higher uh, number than I think a lot of folks had thought of prior to. So why do older adults use cannabis? And there's, a lot of re there's a lot of reasoning to this. And again, we want more research to explore this a little more. But a lot of folks seem to cite medical use, that, um, uh, that they are trying to treat pain or anxiety or appetite or something else. Um, now, it's important to note, we've talked a lot about medical versus retail use. Someone who doesn't have a medical authorization uh, card does, doesn't mean that they aren't trying to use medically. They just may be purchasing through the retail system. Now, a lot of folks may also view cannabis as an alternative to other medications. Um, now, there's also, it's also worth noting, a lot of folks may have used earlier in their life and then, then stopped for a variety of reasons. And then now that the legal status is changing, the, the, the kind of social stigma around it is changing, folks who may have used in the past may be willing to kind of try again. And so, and again, a lot of this goes hand in hand with the decreased perception of risk or harm. So we wouldn't be the Poison Center without providing some harm reduction tips. Now, this is um, this can apply to anyone, but this is specifically for, for folks, for adults, uh, older adults especially, who may be taking other medications. We really, one of the biggest things we encourage folks to do is, is to talk about cannabis use, to ask their provider, ask their doctor, to call the poison center. You can call us just to get information. It doesn't have to be an emergency to call us, um, but, to, but to continually be asking and seeking that information. 
And then using medication management strategies, again, especially if folks are taking other medications. And we bring this up because the more we learn about cannabis, the, the more we realize it can actually interact with other medications. It can alter or, or diminish or change the, the efficacy of other medications. And we don't, don't want that. that. That can be no good. Um, so we encourage folks to use an organizational system of some kind for their basic medications and to start getting in the practice, if they use cannabis, of including cannabis in these systems. So Megan did a fantastic job of putting together a lot of these uh, resources, and she uploaded a lot of these into the material section. Folks are welcome to download. These are publicly available and free. One of the basic ones is medication calendar, um, and folks can add um, <clears throat> excuse me, folks can add uh, uh, their standard medications when they take them, the dose and, and, and all that. There are a bunch of apps that will do this as well. Um, and Megan, please feel free to chime in if I'm leaving out crucial, important things here, because again, this is Megan did such a great job with these. Using a medication list can also be really, really, really helpful um, and including over the counter medications, vitamins, supplements. It doesn't have to be prescribed to document. Um, and including the name of it, the dose, time, and any special instructions. And then the really key thing here is taking these lists with you to healthcare appointments. Um, that can be really, really crucial because that'll help help providers see if there's a potential interaction. And again, there are some other uh, lists here. This is a, <clears throat> a worksheet in this style um, has one sheet per medication. And this kind of helps if, if, that if any medication changes, it's a little easier to change it just on one sheet there. Now, Megan, did I leave out any, any crucial details with the med management supplies there? The, those I resources? think you're good, Alex. Just a Perfect. reminder that all of these resources, I uploaded them into the materials section. Uh, so you can download them today. You can also go to our website and we have a lot more med management resources located there. Perfect. Thank you. And we do have other trainings that go way deeper and a lot more detail on med management, if that's something of interest to you. Okay, so we get this question sometimes. Uh, we actually get this question a lot. Of, well, what do I do if I'm too high? Uh, what, what can I do to, to, to re, um, reduce that? Um, and we talk to our uh, some of our call takers. Um, if you ever hear us use the term spy, we're referring to a specialist in poison information. Because Megan and I aren't allowed, we're, we, we don't have the qualifications to give treatment advice, and they do. So we asked them, what do we tell folks? And they said, first state, nothing is proven to decrease level of impairment from cannabis. We've heard some pretty wacky stories and substances out there. Um, uh, yeah, that, that at least as of now, there's no uh, evidence to back right now. So what do folks, or what should folks do? First is don't take anything additionally. Um, by and large, staying put and waiting for the effects to kind of naturally decrease on their own. Do not under any circumstances drive. Um, again, still get a DUI. The uh, cannabis intoxication absolutely reduces coordination and a lot of things we need to drive safely. Um, being careful about falls. This is a big one. Uh, it can kind of mess with equilibrium, can make folks feel dizzy, um, and folks can fall. Having a buddy is always a good idea, someone to kind of, you know, watch your back. And then absolutely always feel free to call the poison center. They may give you the exact same walkthrough here, they may give you some more specific um, um, treatment advice. Um, and if there's ever a concern of what you need to be, you need to see, a, 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 um, if you, need, you need to go into the ER right now, they will help set that up. All right, shifting gears toward youth here. So we're going to talk a little bit about well, why do youth use? Now, a lot of this info comes from the, the series of listening sessions that Public Health Seattle King County put on a couple years back. Um, Really, really great report to read. Now, they asked a lot of kids. Um, they didn't ask them questions on their own personal use, but they wanted to get their their perception of of use around them. <clears throat> and they asked them, "Well, why why do kids use?" Um, and these four answers were the the main ones that kids report using because of peer pressure, because they're curious. There's the sense that well, everyone's doing it. Well, why why shouldn't I? And there's also the sense that that a lot of kids are self medicated that a lot of kids are trying to cope with stress. And then they also ask them the reverse of that question. Why do kids not use? So essentially, what's a protective factor for kids? Um, and fear of consequences was a big one uh, uh, across a variety of arenas there. Support from peers and family. And this, I, I like to draw attention to this one because support from peers and family 
um, along with healthy communication with peers and family. This right here is one of the most protective factors against pick a thing. Um, it, it, it's, it's extraordinarily powerful. Um, and also knowledge of health risks could, could be a good protective factor for kids to not use. <clears throat> so um, a, a little bit on perception of harm, because we talked about this a bit with older adults. Same is true with kids. So there is a high perception that the popularity of it, the normalization of it is more influential than the possible risks of cannabis use. And that again, it feels more normalized over time, especially since legalization. And there's this idea of, well, why is it legal if it's harmful? And again, there's this belief in medical benefits of cannabis, of therapeutic benefits, which kind of makes cannabis feel very different from, from uh, other substances such as alcohol. Now, this is a picture of a, a billboard. I don't know if this one's still up, but it was at least a year ago. Um, and the caption reads, and it's a little dark, hard to see, uh, uh, horizontally, weed, cannabis, chill, it's legal. Vertically, it says we can chill. So again, it captures that idea of, eh, it's legal, why are we concerned? It's benign, right? Now, the other, the earlier presentation we um, gave will go in a lot more of what the evidence says about therapeutic effects versus harmful effects and, and risks. Um, but one of the big concerns we have with youth use, um, first, is that the endocannabinoid system, this is, this is a system in everyone. Every human has this. Um, this is what cannabis acts on and it, what it affects directly in the body. Now, this system is incredibly active during adolescence. Now, adolescence, is, it's sort of its hallmark is this brain development, right? It's the refining of all these synapses and neurons and all that. And the endocannabinoid system does a whole bunch during that. We're still learning about what it's actually doing, but we can see it light up. We can see it being really active. So this kind of breaks down to this concern that if we have this system that's really crucial to brain development, what happens if we start throwing these other cannabinoids at it, these other elements of cannabis at it? Um, we don't fully know the a lot of the long-term effects of what this could lead to. Um, we do have a lot of concern that there, there could be consequences for um, coping, for learning how to cope with stress and anxiety. There's also, um, there's more research to back this, that the earlier someone uses cannabis, the greater their risk of developing dependence, that physical dependence on cannabis is. So problem cannabis use, this is how another publication, another review defined it. And it's basically another way of saying uh, uh, addiction, ad ad addiction to cannabis. Um, and it, uh, kind of falling back on the disrupts other aspects of life and it identifies social, interpersonal, occupational, and a few other realms here. So it went through and found risk factors for problem cannabis use. And again, initiating at an early age is, is a pretty big one. Um, being male and smoking cigarettes, interestingly, was a, was were considered risk factors. There's a bit more nuance here about being male and the severity of problem cannabis use, not the recurrence though, that doesn't seem to differ uh, uh, by uh, gender gender identity um, and the increasing increasing the frequency of use in the development of problem cannabis use and this makes sense it, it, you have more if there's a greater likelihood that there may be a problem with it. so we also again a uh, major depressive disorder it can be a risk factor and again being male you'll see being male popped up a couple times because it's different evidence statements that found different levels of evidence around it now this one here this is sort of the the crux of um, risk factors for adolescents is that we probably know that, that this list um, uh, are risk factors specifically during adolescence. So frequency of use, uh, um, younger age of first alcohol use, interestingly, nicotine use, parental substance use, all of these others, which really, if you're looking at this list, it looks a lot like a list of ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. So bringing the gateway hypothesis back, um, we mentioned this earlier with adults, when we apply it to adolescents or adolescents and young adults, we very likely know that cannabis use is correlated with other substance use or substance use disorder in adulthood. Uh, and this includes tobacco. Um, again, we're not saying, we can't say that cannabis use causes substance use disorders or substance use um, with other substances, but we do see a potential correlation. And then um, this one below, it's just a slight, it's the same statement, but less evidence um, that we probably know that cannabis use is correlated with alcohol 
use and alcohol use disorder. Little bit on youth mental health. Um, we, we really don't know if cannabis use during youth will increase the risk of, of later developing anxiety. But we have some evidence, so we think we know, we may know that cannabis use will increase the risk of later developing depression uh, in adulthood. And, and this is a really uh, unfortunate correlation, a really, really heartbreaking one. We probably know that there is a link between youth cannabis use and suicidality. Okay, folks, we're getting very close to the end. We're gonna wrap things up with just a little bit of uh, uh, communication. And so a lot of this comes from those listening sessions, those focus groups that uh, they ask questions like, well, who do you trust to talk to about, about uh, uh, cannabis? Um, where do you get your information from? What information sources do you trust? And youth reported that they want facts, that, that they don't like biased information. They want as unbiased info as possible on health effects, both short and long term, on mechanisms of cannabis, on how, how it works. They want research about risks and benefits. So we, they want to know what folks know. And they absolutely do not want exaggeration or shaming. A lot of past um, and current um, uh, uh, substance use prevention campaigns rely on scare tactics, on shaming and exaggeration. And kids don't like that. It statistically does not work very well. Um, and I think this is a really important point that youth are aware that most sources of info have an agenda behind them. This includes health ed educators. This includes the cannabis industry. They're aware of an agenda and they don't always trust that agenda. Now, a little bit on format. So youth reported that they don't want to be lectured at. They don't want someone uh, coming in and talking at them about this, that they really want open discussion with accurate info with someone they trust, with an influential adult. That could be a parent, a teacher, a, um, a, a family friend, a coach, whoever that is, they want that kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, and, and this act, you know, giving accurate info, I like this line here, it acknowledges the decision-making uh, of youth and the agency of youth. Youth also said, give them relevant risk messaging. If you're gonna give risk messaging, make sure it applies to them. And the example we came up with was maybe explaining some, some respiratory concerns of, of smoking cannabis might appeal to an athlete or a musician. Um, and then locating messages where youth engage. And so they specifically listed social media and magazines. Social media makes sense to me. I was really surprised to see magazines were listed here. All right, so, um, and again, we're, we're gonna send these slides out, for, out to folks. And well, actually, I believe Megan, you uploaded, yes, you did. Megan uploaded the PDF there. Um, so a lot of these are hyperlinked. A lot of these resources are hyperlinked. You can click on that and follow those links. So the Poison Center, we have our data reports. The Healthy Youth Survey is a really useful tool that looks at um, uh, what youth are reporting in their use. Um, that's statewide. Um, there are a couple others as well. And we, we always like to include um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline there. There's that phone number at the bottom. Um, there are a plethora of coalitions um, uh, around the area that are doing a whole bunch of work um, around substance use in general, as well as cannabis use. Feel free to check those out. There are a bunch of resources, and, or excuse me, a bunch of campaigns. Uh, a lot of these are around how to have these conversations, um, how, to, how to initiate this dialogue. Oh, and there are a ton of other ways to get involved. Um, the Liquor Cannabis Board, this is the main regulating entity um, of cannabis in Washington. They are, uh, they like to be as publicly accessible as possible. They want to hear public feedback because a lot of what they hear when they're considering different rules, um, they hear a ton from the industry and a little bit from public health. They don't hear much from um, uh, the public in general. And they, they do like hearing that. All right, we are at the very end. We've got four minutes to go. As a reminder, here is our number. If you haven't added it into your phone just yet, and I uh, want to do a little plug here. Megan and I are going to be, uh, and Ma uh, Amy mentioned this earlier, Megan and I are going to be doing an additional training kind of broadly on adolescent substance use and uh, kind of uh, the, the Poison Center perspective behind that. It'll be another Saturday morning, uh, January 23rd at 10. Um, here's the registration link, but again, you can follow in that PDF.
Now we've got some time for questions. And if you think of something after the fact, um, after we close out today, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to, um, uh, to send more materials as I, as I come across them. If you have uh, feedback on this, we'd love to hear that. Um, and I'm getting a reminder from Megan that we got to launch some polls. So hang on just a sec. They won't take very long at all, but we, we really, really love to know. Um, oh, where'd you go? There we are. Uh, we'd like to know how you learned about this to begin with. So um, there is that. Feel free to please answer that if you wouldn't mind. This gives both us and uh, King County Library Services a sense of uh, our outreach. Oh, awesome. Folks are voting. Thank you so much for doing that. I'll give it just a couple more seconds and then we'll move on to one more. Again, it's short, it's easy. It's not, not a big painful test or anything. All right, I'll go ahead and close that out. I will share this just in case folks are curious too. It looks like most folks heard about this from a friend. So word, word of mouth is great. Thank you all so much for that. All right, we're gonna do one last one. Whoops, wrong button there, too many buttons. And we're gonna launch this guy here. There we are. Sorry about the delay there. This is just sort of a smattering of some of the topics we can cover at the Poison Center. Um, and, and we like to get a sense of what folks are interested in taking. And you are always, always, always welcome to reach out to, to Megan, to myself. My, my email address is on this last uh, slide here. And just request training. We don't charge for this kind of thing. This is, this is our job um, and we like doing it. All right, I'll leave it for just another couple seconds. Looks like most of you have voted. And I'll share this out as well, just to so folks can get a sense of uh, what others are thinking. Because why not? It looks like a lot of folks, it's sort of a tie between vaping and opioids. So we absolutely have plenty of material on both. Um, so as always, reach out to us directly if you'd like to schedule something for yourself, for your community, for your organization, um, and keep an eye out for uh, additional programming through uh, King County Library Services, through our newsletter. We're, we're doing this kind of thing all the time. So with all of that, are there any questions with one minute to go? All right, I'm not seeing an explosion of questions, which is totally fine, not a problem at all. It's a Saturday morning, go, <laughs> totally cool to move on with uh, the, your weekend. Wonderful, and Megan is adding the registration uh, link to the January presentation. Now, Amy, before we kind of wrap everything up and sign off, is there are there any other last uh, announcements or anything you'd like to state before we do? No, um, I just wanted to thank everybody in our audience for joining us today, and also thank you to the Washington Poison Center, specifically Alex and Megan, for partnering with the King County Library System to bring this program to you this morning. So thank you very much. All right, thank you all so much. I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting. I hope you have a fantastic Saturday and weekend. Bye everyone.